Because what would always happen is, uh, the, is they'd always tell me like, which is like, if you go to Japan, like you're gonna be so popular with the girls, everyone's gonna be all over you. And girls would tell me this. And I'd be like, well, so why don't you like me then? Like, what's, uh, what's the deal with that? <laughs> what's up, Kodakara Squad? Welcome back to the podcast. Make sure, as always, to destroy the like button. Yeah, so this week we're talking to Matt vs. Japan. And this is actually round two of talking with him. We actually did an interview with Matt uh, about a year ago. So go check that out if you haven't already. But in this episode, we catch up on uh, what he's been studying with Japanese today, what it's been like dating his Japanese girlfriend. And in the second part, we talk about the current projects working on at Freefold and his future goals with his YouTube channel. So make sure to subscribe so you don't miss that. And as always, we have bonus clips on Patreon if you want to support the podcast. But if you guys enjoy the podcast. <laughs> Alright, Matt, so have you been studying or exploring anything new in Japanese? Because on Twitter, you tweet out some interesting stuff lately. Yeah, well, recently something that, that I've been looking into a little bit more is how pitch accent works in Kansai Ben. And so this is something I've always been a little bit interested in, but, and, you know, I've looked into it a little bit here or there, but for some reason, a couple of weeks ago, I, cause uh, I, I've been also, you know, I'm always kind of paying attention to normal standard Japanese pitch accent. So uh, I was kind of going back and like reading, reading through uh, the little bit of like resources that I had on it. And for whatever reason, it just seemed really interesting. And so I ended up kind of diving into a, a, a little more deeply. And yeah, it's really interesting for a couple of reasons. The main reason being that it actually is the the pitch accent in Kansai, which is actually called Keihan. They call it Keihan Shiki Accento. Uh, so, it, but it's basically, yeah, what's used in Osaka Ben, Kansai Ben, and some other places. It It's closer to the pitch accent system that was used a long time ago, like a thousand years ago, than Tokyo pitch accent is so if you actually mm. kind of read into the hi- history of pitch accent and a lot of this is kind of speculative but what scholars think is that basically about a thousand years ago there was one single pitch accent system and then that kind of spread across japan and morphed in different ways and and, de- and evolved into all the different pitch accent systems that exist today so a lot of people know that there's many different pitch accent systems right it's like one of the biggest arguments against studying pitch accent like oh when you go to kansai it's the opposite of when you're in tokyo and it's different in tohoku or whatever yeah but and that's true but they all have a certain relationship to one another so for example words that have the odaka pattern in tokyo generally have the atomodaka pattern in kansai and there's these relationships to it so they're not just like random in each one and scholars think that all these different systems evolved out of what used to be a single system uh, about a thousand years ago or something like that. And so basically the... the, con- the Probably Chinese. Uh, I mean, I don't know the relationship between ac- accent and Chinese. I think I don't think it actually stems from Chinese, but there's some interesting... I actually have another book right now that I was looking at that talks about the relationship between the, the tones of Chinese words and then the pitch accent of, of like words that come from Chinese and like how uh, that right. yeah I kind of noticed that sometimes I would like kind of expect it to be like hey bon if it weren't uh, like a downstep t- uh, word yeah yeah there's like the uh, yeah when you look into the pitch accent that like like for example w- one thing I noticed is that although there's all these relationships between pitch accent in Tokyo and Kansai and they're normally different the the, the Congo or the words that are f- that are from Chinese generally have the same pitch accent in both systems so that they're kind of like somehow different than than the rest, but I still don't know that that much about it. But but uh yeah, it's in, so basically yeah, what I was saying is that Kansai and pitch accent's interesting because it's closer to the it it's older basically. It's closer to what it used to be, and it used to be a lot more complicated. That's the other thing. It's just straight up. It's not just different. It's straight up more complicated, and there's way more that you have to keep track of. Like basically, mm. uh, this will probably not like not be interesting to people who haven't like looked into. Tokyo pitch accent and all, but basically in in Tokyo pitch accent, whether a word starts high or starts low is is it depends on on the context and it's not specific to an individual word. Whereas in Kansai, words either always start high or always start low, and that's part of the pitch accent. And so, basically, that just means that there's more total patterns that that a, a noun could be because words either start high or start low, and then they either have a drop or don't have a drop. So, you know, there's words that start high and then they're all flat. And then there's words that are low, start low, and then they're flat. And then there's words that are low and then they go up and back down. And then there's words that are high, that are high, and then they go down. So there's like way more patterns to keep track of. And also like with when verbs conjugate, you have 
to like, keep track of whether the verb is like ichidan or goldan conjugation and how many mora the word is and and I, when it's in the dictionary form. So it's just like, it literally just feels like pitch accent on a hard mode. And it's been really fun to study because I used to think that Tokyo pitch accent was really complicated and it is really complicated. But now, like when I look at Tokyo pitch accent, it's like, oh, that's just like level one. Basically, there's like, you know, way more complicated stuff. And even mm-hmm. there's there's even like pitch accent. Well, right now, I'm specifically studying pitch accent of like Osaka. That's where I'm focusing on. But uh, apparently the pitch accent in Kolchi is the one that is the closest to a thousand years ago. It's almost like exactly the same. And it's even harder. There's like even more patterns and more distinctions and, and all this stuff. So, yeah, it's really interesting to study just because it puts like for me, I used to only know standard Japanese pitch accent. And now I kind of now that I'm learning this other one, I have this perspective and I realize some of the you know mm. features that make Tokyo pitch accent unique because I can see what it has in common and what's different between that one and the other systems. So are you just studying it for like a linguistic perspective or do you actually want to be able to speak like authentic Kansai? Mm, I mean, I don't know yet. I haven't decided, but I think, I, I mean, my main purpose now is kind of just, yeah, the like the curiosity about it. And I think it would be cool. Like well, one thing I have been doing is like listening to a lot of, of like Kansai Ben and trying to be able to hear what's going on in the pitch so that it's not just like knowledge that I have in a book. I want to be, I want to be able to like actually hear it and know like, Oh, yep, that was a drop. That was a rise. And it happened because of these reasons. And so I think that would be cool. And I do think that doing that might have some benefits for my standard Japanese, because for example, one thing I've noticed is that, like I just said in, in standard Japanese, whether a word starts high or starts low, isn't part of the pitch accent. And so I don't think my brain is very attuned to, paying attention to that. I, and so when I listen to Kansai, I'll notice that I can pick up on the drops pretty easily, like where the pitch drops, but I'll like subconsciously ignore whether a word starts high or starts low. So I'll be like listening and I'll hear a drop and I'll be like, oh, I heard that drop. What pattern was that? And then I'll go, well, to know what pattern it was, I have to know whether it started high or started low. And I have no recollection of that because my brain probably just ignores that information basically. So I think training myself to hear uh, Kansai pitch will, will train my brain to pay attention to whether it starts high or starts low. And I think that might have some kind of carryover benefits in, in Tokyo where uh, maybe I'll naturally notice more that I would otherwise. And, and I think also just like learning a different pitch accent system might help my brain go like, oh, this is there's like different things going on here and it will maybe have some kind of like pitch accent awakening effect or something. I don't know. So yeah, a lot of it's also just the experiment of it. Cause I don't know anyone. I've never talked to anyone who's like actually studied multiple pitch accent systems. So yeah, for me, it's kind of just an exploration right. and I'll see where it takes me. But, uh, and, and I don't know if I'll ever try to like fully speak Kansai Ben, but at least I could like, you know, do a 30 second long impression, impression. that would have perfect pitch <laughs> accent. And then that would probably, you know, be a really cool party trick too. So. Right. Yeah, I think people, most of the time, whatever accent you learn in the beginning, it's really hard to break out of that. Like, I've met, like, I met this one girl who dated a, a person from Kansai for, like, five mm-hmm. years, and she can only speak in Kansai Ben. Yeah, I, I and, think that's really true. Yeah, I, yeah. I also have a friend who, like, the, the first person he dated spoke Kansai Ben, and although now he speaks standard Japanese, he still has some little quirks that, that like, he's ha- that he has a really hard time, like, weeding out. But at the same time... I, th- you know, there's British actors who can play American characters in movies, right? And do like a perfect American accent. Yeah. So I know it has to be possible. That, I, that's like how I think about it is I'll probably have like a natural way of speaking. And then I could like put on yeah. an accent. And in the ideal world, yeah, I'll just be able to like switch it on and off. In reality, I'm sure that if I go too far into Kansai, it will like negatively affect my standard Japanese. And I'll end up just like, because, right. you know, it's impossible to keep them totally separate, you know? So... Maybe I'll yeah. regret it, but again, it's all part of the grand experiment. So even if that happens, I'll be able to tell people, um, no, don't do that. It will mess you up. And I'll actually, you know, know for mm. sure. But I guess in movies, though, they, they probably take like multiple takes trying to nail that English accent. And they probably True. have like a, a, a guy saying the sentence like, OK, how does it go again? <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> but at the same time, it's kind of like because I've thought about this. Like if you if you're filming an American movie, like I remember there was some movie where Emma Watson was playing an American character or something, right? And actually, I feel like her accent was not her American accent was not perfect in that movie, actually. So this probably isn't a good example. But in mm. it, like if you, in this case, right, there's so many different American actors to choose from 
why would they go out of their way to choose a British actor if it was going to be a bigger hassle? Because they'd have to be like taking things multiple times for the accent, right? right. I assume they got to be like almost perfect for them to even consider, you know, going with them in the first place. Yeah, it makes sense. So, but who knows? Again, uh, you got it. Plus, I'd also even if it is true that actors can do it, I'm not an actor, so that doesn't. There's a good chance that, uh, yeah, the actors could do it, right. but I can't do it. So uh, <laughs> there, there's that as well. But anyway, yeah, like I, like I said, well, we'll all know in time for for the better or for the worse. Maybe you'll become an actor in the process. Who knows? Yeah, first white guy to play a Kansai, a native Kansai role in uh, Japanese movies. Uh, <laughs> and nobody mentions the white part. Because you're supposed to be fully <laughs> Japanese. Yeah, that, uh, of course. Yeah, that and that would be amazing if that happened. So I'm gonna actually, you know, they say shoot, uh, reach for shoot for the moon and you land on the stars or something. I'll, I should make that my goal. And then uh, even if I don't achieve that, maybe at the least I could do like a good Kansai Ben impression or something. You have a short break from the channel. Next thing you know, you're in the those top of <laughs> of Japanese <laughs> movies. <laughs> yeah, oh, I mean, man. it would be kind of cool though, because in general, I think Kansai culture, especially like like Osaka culture, is more similar to like Western culture than Tokyo is. And a lot of the things that you hear people say ab- about Japanese culture that maybe they don't really like, like they're kind of too strict and they're kind of cold and not friendly. A lot of that is really Tokyo, not Japan. And I know I, the friends that I've had from Osaka are like way more chill and way more funny and, and outgoing on average than people from Tokyo. So it would be cool to like maybe, uh, yeah, like, hey, may- who knows? Maybe I'll end up like moving to Osaka one day and then uh, and just going full Osaka or something. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, you know, possibility. Who knows? Exciting. A lot of people in Osaka, actually the entire city right now, just with that one statement, they're waiting. They're waiting for the countdown. <laughs> <laughs> nah, no promises. No promises. <laughs> there, we, there we go. Now it's all good. It's all good now. <laughs> the last time I was like in Osaka, mm-hmm. I, I went from like, to- I took a trip from Tokyo to Osaka. And when I was in the train with my friend, it was so loud, like everybody speaking, that it was almost hard to talk to my friend. Mm. And then when we went back to Tokyo, it was so quiet that we had to whisper like in the train and then even whispering some guy looked at us and was like like had that eye like shut up (laughs) yeah yeah i mean that sounds like uh america over here i know when i ride the train here in in portland it's a lot lot of times they're super loud but but hopefully at least the the thing the thing i can't stand over here on the trains over here is when people are just like blasting music hopefully in osaka they at least don't uh (laughs) yeah i've seen that (laughs) so far in japan (laughs) But I guess like you 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 talked about how you watch Kansai and stuff mm-hmm. now. So do you find did you find any content that you would recommend that's specific to Kansai? Yeah, well, I mean, most Japanese comedy is done in Kansai in in like Osaka Ben specifically. So pretty much like all of Japanese comedy. So there's tons of content just on YouTube of yeah Osaka Ben. And basically for me, because I'm interested in you know authentic. Osaka Ben. I'm mainly wanting to listen to things that are unscripted because in general, I think this is true for all language. Things that are scripted are not a good representation of like natural authentic speech because it it actually takes a really skilled writer to be able to write a conversation that that actually sounds like an an actual conversation off the cuff because off the cuff, you know, people don't speak in perfectly formed sentences and they repeat different things and they, you know, stumble and all there's all all these different factors that make authentic speech authentic and also we have this idea of how people speak i think in our heads that like even natives we have this idea of what like speech sounds like that is actually different than from how people actually talk so when you go to write a write a conversation or something i think you naturally end up writing this idea this like fake idea you have of what natural speech is whereas when you just speak you just speak naturally it's probably actually similar to how uh you know when people first learn how to draw they have a hard time drawing things because they're not actually looking at something and drawing what they're seeing, but they're like half doing that and half just, just like drawing the, the concept that they have in their head. And so that's why there's that tech, that technique where if you take a picture and you turn it upside down and you try to draw it upside down, you actually like can do it better than if you're, if it's the right side up, because when it's upside down, it like your brain can't view it as, as just like a symbol. It has to actually look at, at what is there. So that's like some kind of random uh tangent but uh but anyway yeah so what i've been listening to on concept Ben is kind of like mostly comedians just like talking having conversations like a really good thing that you can watch on youtube that uh is uh matsumoto Hitoshi no suberanai suberanai hanashi 
which is basically this Japanese TV show. It's also on some of some of it's on Japanese Netflix, but it's actually yeah, this really cool TV show where comedians just take turns telling stories. And the name of the show is Subera Nai Hanashi. Like uh, I was gonna say what it literally means, but there's this word in Japanese Suberu that they pretty much that we don't really have in English that basically means to like s- say a joke and have it fall flat. Uh, it literally means to like slip, like slip and fall. So Subera Nai Hanashi means like you know you're tell uh, Hanashi is like story. So you're telling stories that like can't fall flat. And so they they'll have like you know 15 comedians sitting around this like giant like what looks like a poker table, and then they have a die like a 15 sided die, and each side has like one of the comedian's names on it. So they roll the die and that, that comedian has to like tell a story on this, like right then that's like, and they're normally like, I don't know, 90 seconds long. And then like has to like get a laugh. And if it doesn't, then you lose, except I've never actually seen someone lose. So, uh, cause you know, that's also Japanese TV. So everyone's social pressure. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Everyone's laughing no matter what. So it doesn't, it doesn't really mean anything, but it's still kind of like, like in the intro to the show, they call it like, uh, so I can't remember exactly what it was. It was like, oh, what I know. So go kakutogi. So they're literally saying it's like, uh, this show is the MMA of <laughs> MMA. comedy. Yeah. And I, I thought that was pretty funny because it kind of is in the sense that like, if you're just telling a story, you can, it's like, you know, you can use anything. Right. Uh, but right. you have to, you don't have any, any, any container it has to be in. It's like anything goes, you just has to have to like talk for 90 seconds and make people laugh. So that's really good. Uh, for just listening practice in general but because you know this is all recorded in one go although they practice them so they sound really articulate it's still you know natural authentic speech and like 90 percent of it's kansai ben because like 90 percent of comedians are from kansai and so that's been really good and also that's like one of the only if you watch it on netflix with a vpn it's one of the only ways i've i've found to watch kansai ben with like exact subtitles but on YouTube, there's basically just all oh, these... Oh, they have Kansai Ben subtitles? Well, yeah, because you know on Japanese uh, TV, generally there's... Like, or Japanese Netflix, with the, when you use a VPN, def- generally they have, like, matching subtitles. And because okay. this show mostly is Kansai Ben, the subtitles match the what they're saying. So it's pretty cool. But also on YouTube, there's just these compilations. Like, if you find one comedian who you like, like one thing, one time, one comedian I've been wa- listening or watching a lot of is Koyabu. Uh, that's like his... Everyone's called him Koyabu. I forget his like first name. Uh, Kazutoyo, maybe Koyabu Kazutoyo. You can watch like just like an hour long compilation of like every story he's told on this show. So it's just like back to back to back, and there's like a ton of those on YouTube for like every comedian who's been on there. So that's like pretty cool. And also Koyabu ha- has this other YouTube channel he does with three other YouTubers called like Zakuri YouTube, and they do like pretty fun stuff on there. Another show that I've been watching, my, my friend from Osaka told me about, is called Niketsu, which is like another two like famous Japanese comedians, uh, Chiha- Chihara Junior and Kendo Kobayashi. And they're just like talking basically on a stage, like kind of telling jokes and telling stories and stuff like that. So I've been like getting like this kind of content where they're just like talking off the cuff and being funny. Cause, so it's like entertaining because they're, you know, comedians that are really funny. And uh, yeah, you get like just a really good sample of natural speech. So. Hmm. I feel like there's something about Kansai Ben where if it's just two people talking, it can become really entertaining. Yeah. Like, I watched this movie the other day where I think it's called, like, Setotsumi or something. Oh, yeah, I've seen And that. it's just two guys by the river talking, and it's, like, a comedy. And the whole movie is, like, that one shot of them at the river talking. Yeah, I watched that a while ago. That was pretty cool. I think it's actually based on a manga. But, yeah, they're speaking Kansai Ben or Osaka Ben in that movie, huh? But Yeah, like, the, the manga, I, I listened to the audiobook. And the audiobook is also just them talking, and it sounds like pretty natural. Yeah, that, that's cool. I, I should rewatch that now that I'm like studying Kansai Ben. Yeah, I, I know in Kansai there's this idea. I don't really know how enforced it is, in, like in real life, but you know what they say is that in Kansai they expect whenever you're telling a story, they expect there to be an ochi, which basically means like a punchline. So if you just like tell a story and there's no like giant like kind of like drop at the end where there's like some sudden unexpected turn that makes it funny and like you know, redeems the whole story, then they'll like get mad at you apparently. And in Tokyo, apparently they don't have that. So people I've heard people from Kansai say like, Oh, when they're talking to people from, from Tokyo, it's really boring because they don't have any ochi to their stories. They just tell you random crap with that has no entertainment value basically. So. (laughs) 
Right. I guess that's why. I guess they're like natural born stand up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's that's like the, the image. Although, of course, I've also heard some Kansai people be like, it's like, well, at the end of the day, you know, uh, you can't, we're all just, you, it's the population of humans. So only, only a certain percentage of them can like really be funny. Uh, but probably the right. average is like higher. But, and I also just think like the culture, like if you're, the culture I know values comedy a lot. So that probably naturally like breeds more funny people because everyone like cares about it and like pay atten- pays attention to it. Nice. Yeah. I mean, so I guess like, do you actively set time now for like studying Japanese or immersing? Or is it mostly like talking to your girlfriend in Japanese and occasionally watching stuff? I mean, yeah, I would say probably, yeah, the latter. I don't like have like formally, like I'm going to try to watch like, you know, this amount of hours per day of like Japanese content. I mean, it, it kind of, yeah, depends on just my interests. Like I said, now I'm kind of like going through this phase where I'm, I'm like pretty interested in, in Osaka Ben and Kansai pitch accent. So I naturally like, you know, at the end of the day, I'm going to watch stuff. I'll like want to watch something from like related to that. And like when I, you know, when I'm doing, you know, when I'm going and like making food or I'm like on the train or something, I'll like naturally want to listen to Japanese, but I'll go through other periods where like, you know, I'm, my main interest is something that isn't really in Japanese. So I'll mostly just do English stuff. So yeah, I really don't have any kind of like, you know, goals or like limits that I put on myself in that way. But yeah, because I'm dating Mm -hmm. a Japanese girl and we only talk in Japanese, that kind of naturally makes Japanese a pretty big part of my life no matter what. And also sometimes we'll like watch stuff together in Japanese. And so, cause I mean, I guess, I guess sometimes we've watched American movies, but like in general, you know, she likes to watch Japanese stuff cause she's Japanese. So when we watch something together, it ends up being Japanese. And of course there's part of me that like, it, it's not, it's not purely like, Oh, I'm just watching this for entertainment value. There's part of me that's like, Oh, and this is going to be good for my Japanese. So I like appreciate that. And and so, yeah, there's some of that, but in general, it's pretty, it's pretty just naturally like whatever, whatever I feel like doing really. Do you, do you talk to your girlfriend about the study of Japanese at all? Or is it mostly like you, you work on Japanese and then you just hang out with your girlfriend? Uh, cause you're probably excited to maybe share with her like stuff you learned about. Yeah. And, yeah. And stuff, um, right? I definitely try to tell her, but she's really sick of hearing about it. Uh, I know that she, cause I mean, <laughs> yeah. uh, she, I mean, She's interested in, in, you know, she, she, I mean, I think she's more interested in the Japanese language on, than probably the average Japanese person. Um, mm. because I know she, she has like interests in, in like translation a little bit and in, in general, uh, is like, you know, likes language. So for some stuff, like a lot of times, if I just have some random question or some random observation about Japanese, I'll like tell her that. And I think she'll get a kick out of it sometimes. Um, but there's definitely like a line where like, I know sometimes I'm like, you know, I, I read something, reading something about concept and pitch accent and I, and I was like, Oh, in this yeah. one, there's this one pattern where it does this. And she's and then, like, I mean, I know she'll like, she'll probably just like listening just cause she, you know, wants to be nice, but I know she, right. I can like tell she like, doesn't really care. So I try to, I try to yeah. not like go overboard with it, but, uh, but yeah. And then also like, she'll like, sometimes she'll like correct me, uh, if I like say something wrong, Japanese. By the way, my girlfriend's sitting right there, so it's like kind of um, weird to talk about it uh, like this in English. But yeah, she's probably not really listening. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like sometimes sometimes she'll she'll correct me um, with like pitch accent stuff or just like in general like being like oh like um, like oh I, I, we don't act like that that sounded kind of weird. I think you're I think you're just like saying so you're like translating english into japanese or something so i'm really happy whenever that happens but i think you know i don't i don't try to like force her to correct every single little thing because that would probably get annoying for both of us honestly so yeah i guess i think she she probably just corrects me when it like naturally sticks out to her something that i said which is like i don't know less than once a day on average maybe 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 once a day on Mm -hmm. average so and that's that's now that we're like um, that she's staying with me. Probably like yeah, she's gonna mention that. But normally she lives in Japan and I live in, in America. But she's like visiting me for this this whole month, and so we're like actually living together. So of course, there's a lot more opportunities for her to correct my Japanese. So now it's only like once a day. Right. When she's in Japan, we like talk most days for like an hour or two, and then most days she probably wouldn't actually correct me. But but uh. Yeah, it's definitely really nice because we only speak in Japanese and she doesn't 
like to speak in English. At least not to me. I think in her mind, well, you know, you know, we all say we have different like personalities in like English and Japanese or, or in like all the different languages yeah. that we speak. And I think she like doesn't really like my English personality. Uh, that kind of <laughs> seems to be the case. Uh, so when I yeah, speak, speak English, you, you would think like if you spoke English, you would have more of a like a mysterious. Language. Yeah. I mean, every other Japanese person I've met is like that, like that. You know, I think what probably a lot of people have heard and I've definitely heard is that Japanese people will tell you like, oh, when you speak English, you sound like really cool. But when you speak Japanese, yeah. you sound cute. And they think it's a compliment. But uh, of course, I don't I I'm never happy to hear that, that uh, I sound <laughs> kawaii when I, right. when I speak Japanese. I want to be kakoi. But right. yeah, for I, yeah. I think, yeah, for whatever reason, this girl was like the only one who was like, oh, no, I like, I like you way better when you speak Japanese. So, of course, that's always like a nice confidence boost, you know? Yeah. I actually had that at a like a discussion, like a very extended discussion with this Japanese girl one time, because mm-hmm. she said that my Japanese was cute and not like kakui. <laughs> and but then she was like, "No, no, no!" I was like, "You want to be cute? Like, cute is way better than kakui." <laughs> In <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think my and girlfriend. There's like I'm, my Japanese. Is I looked cute it up, too. and a lot of people actually think that. As yeah, well. I've heard that before. So yeah, it's it's hard because you know Japanese culture is so different, and I know that if a, a guy being cute can be like and that can just mean that they're attractive it's like a fully positive thing but it's still as an american hard to fully get on board with the kawaii uh you know <laughs> <laughs> they're not about Mato that. The kawaii-chan. <laughs> yeah but i mean i know my girlfriend still uh says that i'm that i'm cute uh like when i speak japanese or just whatever but i know that she actually likes it so it's kind of like okay i guess because i know like sometimes i've definitely been like friend zoned in the like like oh no you're like you're really kawaii like uh but i that was really interested in you you know like, so that, that i've had experiences like that so that's why i'm like really skeptical but i know at least in the case of my my girlfriend that uh that she actually does like me and is i'm kawaii i guess so it's it's whatever i see so so it's more a form of ptsd rather than probably yeah probably because <laughs> yeah, what would always happen is uh is they t- like when i was at college uh and I, I had a bunch of foreign exchange student friends that always tell me like, Nihon itara zettai moteru yo. which is like, yeah, yeah. If you go to, when you go to Japan or if you go to Japan, like you're going to be so popular with the girls, everyone's going to be all over you. And girls would tell me this and I'd be like, well, so why don't you like me then? Like, what's the, what's the deal with that? <laughs> so, uh, I never believed them. So, <laughs> so yeah, I definitely probably have a little bit of yeah, PTSD there. <laughs> Can't be saying that anymore to you. But I, I guess speaking of like personalities, what does your girlfriend think about your YouTube channel, Matt vs. Japan, as a YouTube personality? Oh, yeah, I, I mean, guess this is probably well. a good thing, but I feel like she doesn't care that much. Because it would honestly like like part of me is always like, like, hey, you see that? So that silver plaque uh, over there, like I'm like special, you know, like uh, but, uh, she, she doesn't seem to really really care. But it's probably a good thing because if if I felt like she like if she if she was too into it, then I would feel like maybe she just likes me because I'm I'm like you know a YouTuber or something, or she thinks that's cool. So ultimately, it's probably yeah a good thing. But um, I mean, I think to a certain extent, she thinks it's like interesting, but not like any more than if I, you know, was like a translator or something like like I, I get the sense that maybe she thinks it's cool that I, you know, support myself doing my own thing. And that I, you know, rather than just being like someone who works at a company, I kind of like found a way to turn my hobby into a living and I'm kind of paving my own path. Mm-hmm. I think she she kind of thinks that that's cool. But the actual just like fact of being a YouTuber, I think, um yeah she doesn't like care too much about i see you ever like in, po- in portland like have somebody come up to you and recognize you like with your girlfriend there it i mean i it happened actually last month where i got recognized and it was pretty cool but my, my, my girlfriend wasn't here yet so i, I wish it would have that would have been, yeah, <laughs> been really so, but, can you can come back at this yeah. date <laughs> at this time it was actually really it was actually really <laughs> surreal because like well, there's a couple of things like and I've talked all the other YouTubers who I've talked to kind of say similar stuff. It's like even when you get like so when you think about it, right, I have like a lot of subscribers, but most of those people aren't like hardcore fans. Most of those people have probably only seen like one or two videos and they click subscribe and they don't really know who I am or like what I do or what I'm about. You know, like if you think about how you use YouTube, I mean, I mean, I can't really speak for anyone else, but I know that's kind of what I do. Right. Like if someone looks interesting, I'll subscribe. 
because I'm you know curious what they're going to do in the future. But I don't like I'm not actually invested in them. I haven't watched all their videos or anything. I don't really know what they're about. And so since the number of people who like know of you is way bigger than the number of people who are your hardcore fan, if you're going to get recognized on the street, it's probably going to be just statistically somebody who knows of you and has seen you but doesn't like really know who you are exactly and all the times that i've been recognized it's like basically been that and it's probably like totals probably happened like four or five times now that i've like gotten recognized and the one that happened the other day was you know i was actually at this the japanese supermarket so first of all you know it's like if i'm gonna get recognized anywhere it's probably at this japanese supermarket where people interested in japanese go to buy japanese related stuff and they're like hey uh, are you a YouTuber? And so I don't even think they remembered my name. I think, you know, they just like had s- seen me on YouTube. And, and I mean, we talked for a second. She was like, oh yeah, I've been learning Japanese. So I subscribed to like you and Dogen and some other people. So, I mean, she, she definitely like knew who I was, but she wasn't like a fan or anything. So it doesn't actually feel like that cool when it happens. I mean, in a sense, it does. In a sense, it feels like, oh, this is, I'm fucking famous, bro. What's up? But at the same time, it's kind of, you, you kind of get the sense. It's like, well, it's not like she's a fan or anything. You know, she just has seen me. So it's, right. it's kind of whatever. And then after that, it's actually really uncomfortable because then I'm suddenly like, wait, anyone around here could like know who I am. Like, does this mean I can't wear sweatpants outside anymore? Like, you know, it's actually kind of, <laughs> there's weird implications of it. So it's a... Uh, I mean, it's a mixed bag. It's I mean, obviously it's it's cool to an extent, uh, and just like a pure like validation point of view. But at the same time, it's it's kind of it does make me think like, okay, I don't, I wouldn't want to be truly famous, or that would be so uncomfortable because then everywhere you go, everyone like knows who you are. You feel like you can't, you know, you got to like watch your every single right. step so that someone doesn't like take a picture of you and put it on the internet. Like I can only imagine right. how awful actually being famous would be. Yeah. Just imagine the paparazzi going after you, like, "Oh, it's Matt versus Japan! Go, 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 go! Snap the shot!" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I think I think I would hate that. Honestly, like I mean, there's already like some people on the internet try to like do that that to me, basically, like uh, you know, take like everything I say and like archive it and like to like use it out of context or something. It's already like pretty annoying. So at least I definitely wanted to stay on the internet. <laughs> Yeah, I guess we can talk more about your girlfriend. This is, this is I feel like, the massive topic that everyone is interested in. I mean, having a Japanese girlfriend to begin with is kind of, I feel like, an ideal of many people in the community. Language learning language, ideal. Yeah, language learning ideal. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there definitely is an aspect of that. But, I mean, to the interesting kind of thing for me is that, like, one, like the idea that if you're learning a language, you should like date somebody who's a native speaker is like a really common old idea. That's a, that like everyone always says. And I actually thought, I always thought that it was kind of like not actually very good advice. And, and I guess I still kind of think that if you're not already like, if you haven't achieved basic fluency yet, but once, if you have like achieved basic fluency, then I think it's, it's like, it probably is like one of the most powerful things you can do to kind of supercharge your language learning experience just because you get all the benefits of like having friends that like native native speaker friends but it's like even to the next level because of course of uh you know of actual intimate relationship is so much more intimate right? right so it's like you probably talk to them way more you do more way more stuff with them and then they're and i mean yeah there, there's there's obviously that benefits on the very practical level, like, oh, you get lots of practice, you know? But I think also from, like, a cultural level, you know, when you get, when you're that close to another, like, human being, of course, you you influence each other so much. And so it's, like, a re- it's one of the best ways to get, like, a really close window into the culture because, you know, you're, you're like, getting s- just so close with somebody who's, like, from that culture. But another thing is, of course, a lot of times we talk about Japanese culture as if it's, like, one single monolithic thing. When in reality, every Japanese person is different. And this is actually, in general, is like a kind of weird problem that I've felt for a while is that, you know, when you're speaking Japanese, you don't like, or to take a step back, like in English, you know, there's, there's certain ways of talking, for example, that sound like cool or intelligent. And there's other ways of talking that sound kind of, you know, uneducated or unintelligent or don't, or just like kind of maybe even cringy, right? Uh, to certain people. And so if you're learning a language, then whether you're learning English or Japanese, you don't, of course, there's Japanese people who most Japanese people think are cringy. And there's Japanese people who most Japanese people think are like, cool. 
So, of course, if you're learning the language, you want to learn how to talk in a way that is cool um, and not kawaii. No, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> in a way, it, it's hard to figure out, like, what exactly is cool? Like, who like who should I imi imitate when I speak Japanese? Who should I make my parent and who should I avoid? Uh, there's, it's, it, there's no easy answer for this because every Japanese person you ask is going to give you a different answer because every Japanese person has, like, different sensibilities. And I found, like, hanging out with Japanese people that, like, there's kind of, like, different, like, subcategories of Japanese people. And they can be, like, really different. Like, there's certain Japanese people that, like, might think a certain word or a certain fashion or a certain genre of music or something is, like, really cool. And then there might be another, there's, like, a whole other subculture of Japanese people who think that same, you know, fashion or, or whatever is, like, really lame and, and like, wouldn't want to go near it. And so, because there's all these, like, conflicting like pocket, like sub pockets of the culture. How do you decide which one you're going to like make your home base? Like, how do you decide which one actually is cool uh, to you and which one you're going to avoid? Be because there's, you can't just look it up in the dictionary, right? And like figure out what it is. It, there is no right answer, right? It is kind of all relative and subjective. And so a, an interesting kind of solution to this problem is actually to, you know, have a significant other who speaks, who's a native speaker of the target language. Because, I mean, if you actually like, and of course all this, you have to like keep in mind of course i'm not saying you should like date someone just because they're japanese or something you have to actually you know like them but if you find a native speaker of your target language who you like actually really vibe with and really like and get along with and just like are really attracted to then that's probably a good person to kind of make the you can make your home base in terms of your like sensibilities in the in the culture because i mean hey at least you vibe with them right so if you vibe with them, then you're probably going to vibe with their whole worldview, like within the culture. So I know like for for um, me, if there's like something where maybe my girlfriend thinks like, oh, no, don't don't say that. That sounds cringy. Then you say that even if there's other people who think it sounds cool. Well, maybe I, I, in general, by default, I'll just kind of like go with her sensibility and her kind of like worldview because, uh, yeah, it's just it, it's a way at first of all, at a practical level, it's a way to kind of have a consistent worldview because if you're always referencing one person then at least you'll, your kind of whole sensibilities will be consistent. And also, it's like at least a way to uh, get something that will probably work well for you because you vibe with the person, so you're probably going to vibe with like their worldview. So there's kind of all these, these intro, interesting like kind of like cultural implications of, you know, dating someone who speaks your target language in, in this way where, yeah, give, like I feel like, like my girlfriend has been like a door into Japanese culture that is like way more um, like mm, that has like helps me get way more connected to Japanese culture at least, or at least one version of Japanese culture than I ever like had before with just friends, you know, normal friends. Right. It, it sounds like we've kind of entered a hidden optional stage of refold over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, it, of course, it's always like I said, weird to kind of talk about because you can't. There, there's always that that kind of like elephant in the room of like, well, you can't recommend dating someone like too directly like dating someone who's your target language because you know right. dating isn't isn't a transactional thing you know so you can't just right. like, you can't just go up to someone and be like hey you're you're japanese so like let's date but but i mean you know <laughs> what if you have a matching system in refold like, <laughs> depending on what you're learning it matches you <laughs> i mean wait is that is that not already exist because i feel like that that got uh some like act, i mean oh it's hello talk i mean yeah kind of. yeah i mean of course yeah of course all actual like um apps to find language partners are are like secretly dating apps but someone should if, if it doesn't exist someone should make someone should definitely make an actual like uh dating yeah. like target language like dating app but i mean like realistically like in my case right i wasn't going out to try to find a japanese girlfriend i was going out to practice japanese and when you and by practicing japanese i was going to places where japanese people are when you go to places where japanese people are you meet japanese people and so it it just kind of happens so i mean it's a pretty natural thing in the you know ultimately if you're studying the language you're going to naturally put yourself in situations with native speakers so then you know it can it can happen but but yeah it's all it's also really cool because i don't like this is actually something i've heard from my other friend who's like married to a, a japanese woman and i haven't i haven't really i don't really experience it with my girlfriend but my friend he gets corrected like all the time like hardcore by his girlfriend and i and he says the reason why is that you know his girlfriend when when or, or his wife sorry i should say like his wife is like well, I married you. So when I introduce you to my friends or my family, I want you to sound as good at Japanese as possible because if you're if you suck at Japanese, I'm going to be embarrassed like for you, right? Cuz we're it's almost like when you marry someone, you know, your identities become kind of like intertwined. You know, you're kind of like a you're like a now a new unit right. uh of like, you know, existence. So right. And that's like 
I guess if you, I mean, obviously this doesn't happen to a lot of people who marry Japanese women because most people who marry Japanese women never learn Japanese. But I mean, I guess if you if you have the right type of person and maybe you're like you start off good enough where they actually like view you as a Japanese speaker. Because maybe if if you just like you don't speak Japanese at all, they're like, well, you don't even you're not a Japanese speaker, so you know it doesn't matter. But if you're good enough to be considered a Japanese speaker, then it's kind of like, oh well, I want you to be as good as possible so that you don't sound dumb and embarrass me, basically, right? So that right. I mean would, sounds like really on a language learning level, right? Like that's the most powerful thing you can happen if you have a native speaker who is like personally invested in you sounding as good as possible. That's you know. Pretty solid. Also scary though. So, oh, watch out! <laughs> a lot but... of pressure. Because <laughs> I've actually hung out with them before, and she'll correct me too, and it honestly uh, gets me down because there's uh, so many corrections. So I also know it's like a double-edged sword, and uh, you don't, you know, be careful what you wish for. But right, I, I have a feeling that after this podcast gets dropped, there's going to be a large influx of people going to Japanese supermarkets. So I guess we have to warn the supermarkets, <laughs> especially the one that one in Portland. <laughs> oh, that'd be so weird if someone like, if someone, I went to that same one and someone's like, oh yeah, I, I, uh, I, I heard you talking on the, on the Kodakata podcast about how you, how you met someone here. So I, I was wondering if I'd see who you here, here you are, but. <laughs> Or you just see them hitting on some some girl there, and you're like, oh, better distance myself away real quick. I did not consent to giving this advice, so this is not my advice. This is not oh, yeah, my oh, advice. Yeah. But, but I'll actually say I actually met my girlfriend at a kind of language exchange at the college that I used to go to. And so uh, it wasn't wasn't just like I went up to some random person on the street, which you can do. But, it's you know, you got to be careful because you can be... It's really easy to be creepy or just like you know, be a nuisance to somebody if you're going and talking to people on the street. But uh, you know, if you're if you have common sense, then it's probably fine in in most cases. Keyword right there, keyword. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully the language exchange shit. Well, the language exchange scene is lit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Yeah, I mean, I find this a really interesting dynamic, though, that you have here. And I guess overall, I mean, we've kind of alluded to this, but in kind of like a statement, would you say that your Japanese has improved like marginally from the point where you started talking to your girlfriend to now? I mean, yeah, I think it definitely has. But I think the biggest thing that changed is just my comfort level, because, yeah, before like dating my my girlfriend, I I never really spoke Jap- like basically the the period of my life that I spoke the most Japanese before dating my girlfriend was when I was at college and I'd hang out with foreign exchange students. And so during that period like most days I would speak Japanese, at least some Japanese. And sometimes it'd be for like multiple hours. But since dating my girlfriend there there's it's like we'll talk most days for like multiple hours and it's just the two of us, right? So it's not like, you know, you're not hanging out with a when you're hanging out with a bunch of people you're not just talking the whole time, right? A lot of times, you know, you're, you're talking some of the time and then you're doing other stuff, but it's like just us talking. So it, it's a, it's much more kind of, you know, focused practice in a way. So right. just speaking Japanese that much every day definitely just helped me get way more comfortable and way more used to it. Like I know what you, what used to happen is if I spoke Japanese all day, I'd get like really exhausted at the end of the day. Or if I spoke Japanese like multiple days in a row, I'd get, it, I'd feel like my brain was starting to melt and I, you know, I couldn't, like think straight anymore but that stopped happening and now i don't really get like japanese fatigued really anymore and yeah also it's just like takes less effort like i remember during the first i mean really for like the whole first year there would be so many times i'm just like oh i don't feel like speaking japanese right now like oh why can't you just understand english like it'll be so easy (laughs) so much easier and especially part of that was because due to the time zone difference i would normally talk to her at night for me so you know i was already i was tired Anyway, so then speaking Japanese on top of that was really hard. But yeah, in the past like six months, because we've kind of been dating for about a year and a half now, for the past like six months, I don't really like feel that way anymore. Like it's very rare for me to get that feeling of like, oh, I don't want to speak Japanese right now. Fuck, like can you speak uh, English? And so I, th- I think definitely, yeah, that comfort level has increased a lot. But if you actually were just going to like take a clip of me speaking Japanese and be like, well, you know, how accurate am I? Like, how many, like, mistakes do I make? How many, you know, pitch accent mistakes? How many things do I say that don't sound native? I mean, that probably has, like, not changed that much. I mean, it's probably changed, but not necessarily, like, improved a lot. Because 
there's probably some like actually like new bad habits that I've like picked up because like before I would only speak occasionally. And so every time I spoke, I would, I would have the opportunity to be like really careful about how I spoke. So I would like, you know, have opportunities to build good habits. Whereas now I speak every day and I speak when I'm tired. So probably, you know, like my brain, I'll, I'll like end up saying the same thing. Uh, like I'll end up saying, I'll, I'll like find something that is like can, can easy to, an easy way to express an idea that maybe is not the most natural, but then I'll like be tempted to use it over and over and make it into a habit just because it's convenient, even though it's not that natural. And also just because, you know, but normally when I meet a Japanese person for the first time, I kind of play this game in my head where I try to be as good at Japanese as possible. So I'm like always asking myself, like, is this correct? Like, is this, is this full? Am I confident that this is natural? And sometimes if I have a choice between saying something that's natural but not really what I want to say or something that's unnatural, but is what I want to say, I'll go with the thing that's natural and compromise my communication in a way mm-hmm. to sound good and like make the Japanese person think I'm like as close to native as possible. And I think that's good for improving your ability, like just being really cautious, making an effort to sound to be as accurate as possible. But to my girlfriend, it's like the opposite. It's really just communication top priority because I mean, she already knows exactly how good I am at Japanese. So there's no point in like trying to, you know, fool her into thinking I'm better than I am. She already knows exactly how good I am and she's not going to be more impressed or less impressed depending on, you know, how I sound. And so it really, and again, it's like, I want to, I would, I also would want to on principle prioritize a relationship over my Japanese, you know, my getting better at Japanese. So I mostly am just like saying the, the first thing that comes to my mind or the easiest way for me to get across what I'm really feeling and not worrying too much about if it's accurate or not. And I think doing having that be like the only really the only context in which i speak japanese for a whole year and a half probably like had some negative effects on my japanese too i imagine um like i i I probably like use certain sentence enders like way too much or like have certain fillers i use way too much or something but but yeah it's, it's definitely way more natural to speak japanese and and feels like less of a burden and that's like pretty cool right I feel like there's that one guy listening to the podcast who had his Japanese girlfriend tracker Excel sheet ready to go, just sitting down like, oh, okay, I guess I can't use my Excel sheet this time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually, <laughs> I, I, I know uh, the one of the friends that I have, who, who the friend who I mentioned who's, whose wife is Japanese and corrects him a lot. I know they have a list on the fridge of uh, mistakes that every time he makes a mistake, they'll like write on the fridge, apparently. Well, oh, and, wow. Yeah, and there's like some kind of point system or something. I don't. Know. So, so <laughs> that that exists in it's the like, world. But I mean, it's, yeah, it depends a lot on your specific... break up at a hundred points. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, that, it depends a lot on probably your, your like specific relationship. Wow. I mean, yeah, like I said, my my girlfriend doesn't really like. Uh, I think, I think she kind of likes the way that I speak Japanese, the foreignness included, the foreignness that is there. Like, and so I see. Uh, yeah, I think in general, she'll, probably, she'll correct me just when something like sticks out because it sounds, I guess it's like, sounds too weird or, or something. But in general, yeah, I think it doesn't, she doesn't like, it's not like she's like noticing all these mistakes and ignoring and like not saying them. I think most of the time she's like so used to the right. way that I talk that it just sounds like, you know, Matt dialect and it's not, doesn't even sound like a, a mistake or something. Hmm. So, and is, is she ever surprised like how good you are um, or, or anything like that? Like what if you use like a, if you intentionally use a difficult word? Does she react in any way or is she just like, okay. Uh, I mean, no, she already knows exactly how good I am. That's the thing. Like, uh, so she, I can't surprise her anymore. Like sometimes I like, like I'm, actually I remember yesterday, um, I, we were talking and I, and I used some like kind of like funny, like light novel style expression that I'd never used before. And actually I had this moment where I'm like, I remember learning this. I learned this in like literally 10 years ago when I was reading Ore no Imoto ga konna ni kawaii waki ga nai. And uh, I <laughs> used it for the very first time. And I think she, I think she might have giggled or something because it was kind of a funny expression. But she's not, surpri- she's not surprised that I know it because she knows I did this crazy ass thing with Anki and that I like know a ton of words. And there's like, sometimes right. she'll be like reading, you know, some some like pretty hard like text for like a college class or something. And not know how to read a kanji and show it to me, and I'll and then I'll know how to read it, and that's just normal. Yeah. Like she's not surprised anymore because it's happened too many times, so she, she just uh, knows it's normal. So I mean, I, I think she was impressed initially, but now it's just um, it's just normal, you know. Yeah, 
like when I was uh, going out with a Japanese girl, I, I was doing Anki like 10 words a day. And sometimes I would use the word that I've just learned, like a yo jujuku go. And like when, but then she, like later on, she'd just be like, no reaction. I'd be like, yo, I just said like, kacho fugetsu. Can you, can you have some sort of reaction? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I definitely know the feeling, but, uh, but I mean, there's also, there's like, there's a lot of times where I'll like, literally, like, like now I know to, to like, if I'm going to try to pull something like that out, I won't just like slip it in as if it was like a normal thing. I'll, I'll kind of do this thing or I'm like, ah, nanka, so, and I'll say it like that, which is like basically like, oh, wasn't there some kind of phrase or something like that means just this? Like, have you ever heard of this phrase, like something, something going? And that way it's like doesn't you don't sound like kind of like a douche or like just like a weirdo if uh, if yeah. it's like way too rare. <laughs> Makes sense. And sometimes when I and a lot of times when I do that, she like to my girlfriend, she'll literally be like, no, I don't know. that. I've never heard of that. And, uh, and then at first, I, like, I used to be, I used to like pull it up on the dictionary and be like, no, look, it, it, look, here it is. Cause I would worry that she'd be like, <laughs> she'd be thinking that I like made it up or that like it was wrong or something. But now I just like, whenever that happens, I'm just, I just, I'm just like, oh, well, there is a word that I means she's like, like, have you ever heard of that word? Something, something? No. Okay. Well, it's a word. Okay. And then we'll just move on. And, uh. Cause, cause yeah, I mean, like I said, she already, she already knows exactly what good I am. So there's no point like trying to impress her really. Right. Yeah. I mean, I find it funny that she had the dictionary ready to go. Just like, poof, it disappears. And like, oh, we're fact checked right here. You ready to go? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, part of it. Yeah. Part of it is probably because I, I was not confident either too. Cause, uh, yeah, I mean, I right. think to this day, you know, like I know when I was learning Japanese, I had this illusion that natives had like infinite knowledge and right. I thought that natives could like read any novel and they'd know every word and. And so, to this day, there's still, like, e even when my girlfriend, like, doesn't know a word that I learned, like, in my first year of learning Japanese, because I read light novels and stuff, it's still, like, part of me is like, whoa, no way? Okay. And so, mostly, I, I like, I, I'm, like, had accepted, but yeah, there's still part of me that is, like, doesn't accept. So, I want to look it up, too, to be like, well, this is, I didn't, I'm not hallucinating, right? This is a real word, right? Like, <laughs> uh, I didn't make this up, right? So, that's why I got to pull out the dictionary, look it up. It's the strats. I mean, either way, you're improving your Japanese. Either way, yeah. But... I mean, that that that's another thing that I'll kind of say that is that is like, especially like dating my girlfriend, among other things, has like kind of changed my perspective with learning Japanese. Is that I think when I was learning for for when I was doing you know like age at hardcore, I didn't really speak Japanese that much for for the bulk of the time. Right, I was just like in my room consuming Japanese media all day and making Anki cards. And so I had a desire to always be improving and to like get as good as possible. But due to my environment, that desire to improve kind of pushed me in this direction of like consuming harder and harder media and learning rarer and rarer words. Because when you're sitting in your room and just like consuming otaku content all day, that's like the only thing, that's the only like obvious way to continue to improve once you reach kind of basic fluency. And I see a lot of people in the community who are kind of doing the same thing. Like there's people who get interested in like Konken which is like the the kanji test for Japanese people. And, you know, right. like, so I, I, I understand that because I, 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 there was a time where I also wanted to like, I oh, one day I'll pass the Konken too. I'll, I'll study for that, whatever. Because it just kind of felt, felt like, you know, that's, that, that's what the image of like somebody who's amazing at Japanese looked like to me at the time. But now that I'm kind of much more in contact on a regular basis or like in tune with like real Japanese people and real Japanese culture, my priorities totally changed because I kind of realized now that like, you know, being able to hold your own in like a conversation and like, you know, be like funny and witty and react and like know all the references and just be able to like be as articulate as possible. That is like so much more important than like knowing obscure stuff and being able to understand like super hard anime, at least to me, to me personally. Right. Yeah. Like, and so, of course, everyone's goals are different. Some people, they don't care about talking to Japanese people or going to Japan. So for them, then it totally makes sense. But I mean, yeah, from my perspective now, I'm much more interested in like getting good at like real life Japanese and sounding natural and and things that, that are going to matter. Like if I were going to go to Japan and like work in Japanese or hang out with Japanese people in real life or like create content for Japanese people. And so like 
from my perspective now, like I, it, it doesn't really matter that I know tons of super rare words and I can read novels published a hundred years ago. Um, I mean, I think it's cool and I still like enjoy that stuff. But part of the reason that I dove that deep in that area was not just because I enjoyed it. It was also because, like I said, I had this desire to always be improving. And I realized now that that desire was kind of pointed, was, was pointed in, in a weird direction. Whereas if I would have had the perspective I had now back then, then from a much earlier point, I would have started like watching less anime and less like drama and watching way more like, like listening to way more like comedians and like unnatural Japanese and also like educational topics in Japanese and practicing speaking and like, and getting re really comfortable with that. And that would have been a lot more valuable to me now and probably me going forward into the future than knowing the super obscure stuff that like even Japanese people don't know. Like most Japanese people don't right. know every single word in like a crazy light novel. Uh, and so it, it doesn't, there's very little practical value in all that stuff. I see. I, do you think anime is is obscure? Because like for me, I can pretty much always find new words depending on like how hard I want to find this anime. And on the other hand, pretty much like the people who watch anime in Japan are like middle schoolers, so they can pretty much understand a hundred percent of all anime, no matter how obscure or niche it is. Right. Mm, well, it, it totally depends because anime is such a vast field, right? There's so many different types of anime. So, like, slice of life anime, yeah, of course, like, a Japanese elementary schooler could probably understand almost all slice of life anime 100%. But when you get into, like, kind of the more difficult anime, like, I mean, in my mind, the difficult anime, when I think of that, I think of, like, Fate Zero or uh, Ghost in the Shell, like, things like that. I think most Japanese, most Japanese people would have to, like, well, first of all, there would be tons of words in, in those shows that they don't know. They could still understand it because they're, like, their overall ability is so good that they can inf they can like infer what what things mean even though they didn't actually know the word so they'd be fine but even so they'd probably have to like pause a couple times and rewind and and really pay attention to like fully follow uh, the the plot and those types of things and at, at least someone who's like not an otaku like I I think th this is kind of like a general principle that that uh, kind of is, is the is, is along the similar this similar lines as the thing I was saying about how I. Japanese people like don't have inf infinite knowledge is that there's a huge like disparity in the amount of like knowledge and the vocabulary between natives. And this is probably true for most languages, but I know it's true for Japanese. Like there's the, the average vocabulary of a, of a Japanese or sorry, the, the vocabulary of a Japanese person is going to differ a lot from person to person, depending on like how much they read slash like how much otaku media they consume. And Someone who's an otaku has a way bigger vocabulary than someone who's like not an otaku just because otaku media uses so right. many of these super rare words. Or somebody who like reads a lot of like literature or reads older stuff or just reads widely will have a way bigger vocabulary. So there are like n like subpopulations of Japanese people that do understand that stuff like perfectly, but probably that's like relatively small compared to all Japanese people. And most Japanese people like there's a lot of anime that they probably couldn't follow really. I mean, like I said, the slice of life stuff is like no problem, but the like more it's like some of the fantasy stuff or the other ones that are like crazy hard there. There's a yeah, I think a lot of natives probably can't understand that 100 percent. I see. At least at least say? if you're if you mean it on the level of like un actually knowing every word, most shows, like I said, people can like infer around what they don't know. So they'll still be able to like enjoy it. No problem. Right, right. And since the last time we talked to you, it's already been a year, but we, we kind of talked about if you would be interested in going to Japan and kind of talking about your time with your girlfriend, would you say the appeal of living in Japan is maybe bigger now? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, de definitely. Because it's, I mean, it's hard to say how much is like directly due to dating my girlfriend and more just due to other factors. But yeah, I definitely right. like have been in the last year feeling like I would want to try living in, in Japan. And so, uh, yeah, I definitely want to, but it's hard to, to, you know, make concrete plans with uh, the pandemic still. I mean, although things obviously are getting better and we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel, it's still hard, hard to, to know for sure. But, but yeah, and of course, and there's different ways I could go. I mean, um, I could like potentially try to like go to grad school in Japan maybe, but maybe not, or, you know. There's a lot of different different paths, so I'm still still I still thinking about like the details, but but in general, I do think it'd be cool to go to to Japan, 
and yeah, try to like ha- make videos. Maybe I mean honestly I don't know because mm, make a new channel Matt in <laughs> maybe I, I mean <laughs> well, I, I, I am like interested in in helping Japanese people learn English, but I don't know if I'll like always want to make videos about Japanese in English because there's always kind of part part of me that kind of feels there's kind of like this paradox in it right because if you're like in, in my, my kind of like ideal for a language learner and of course this is just me so me personally subjectively I, I don't think i don't think other people should feel the same way i think everyone has their own kind of like ideal model of like language learning and what language learning means to them but for me language learning is kind of like a pro a discovery process of you know finding this new culture and new language and and learning to understand it from their point of view and and eventually being able to participate in it yourself in you know with as little barriers as possible so for me my kind of ideal for like learning japanese kind of would would have been i learn japanese i go to japan i live a life in japanese with japanese people and in a way if i'm like always kind of reporting back in english what's going on like as if i'm kind of like this agent like like hey guys i'm i'm like i've infiltrated the enemy's base this is what's like going on it's kind of like you know this like li- this this last string that i never cut that like keeps me from like fully integrating like right. into the culture you know like like i feel like probably the foreigners who are the best at japanese probably are not on the internet at all they're probably like just completely living in some town in some prefecture in japan their whole life's in japanese and they don't make any content in English. They make all the content in Japanese. And there there are even people on the internet who do that. Like there there are uh American people yeah. or other foreigners who have moved to Japan and they have a YouTube channel in Japanese and they only make content for Japanese people. So when I see those people, I'm always kind of like jealous, I guess. I'm kind of like, "Oh man, this is that this is what I was supposed to do. What am I doing like doing stuff in English?" You know, like my all my content in English. So, I don't know. I I think uh I, I mean, I think I'll, I'll always make some videos in English, but I also kind of can see a possibility of like, hey, maybe when I go to Japan, I'll kind of switch and put most of my effort into like making content for Japanese people. And yeah, I don't I don't know. I'll, I'll have to see, you know. And also, I also just kind of feel like the, the whole like J-Vlogger thing is like, so it's like been done like so many times. Like, I don't think I have anything new to contribute to it, you know? Right. Yeah, just other than, hey guys, what's up? It's Matt here. I'm in Tokyo. Just arrived. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, I'm going to go blow some minds again. Japanese people, you know, they're, like, it's like kind of like, you know, I only do that so many times. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I feel like it's always interesting to get a new take, kind of go for something new in these fields, especially. I feel like vlogging in general has kind of been on the decline as it is, but. I'm I'm excited for a potential future Matt in Japan. I really love the name, Eric. You're you're a genius right there. You're a genius. <laughs> I'll take a ten percent friendship uh, cut. <laughs> well, we got to think of the Japanese name. Yeah, what's what's the uh, what would I call myself in Japanese? I got to think of that too. But bring out the katakana English. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 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 that's actually actually pretty good. Damn, you came up with that on the spot. That was pretty good. Okay, that one I might, that one I might have to pay you ten percent of royalties on. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. This is just the first part of our conversation with Matt. So go make sure to subscribe and check out the second part where we catch up on what he's working on today and what his goals are for the future. Don't forget to hit the. Don't forget. Don't forget to obliterate the like button. We'll catch you on map part two. Peace.